Hi, I'm Dr K and this is the second lecture in the series of eight lectures on automotive engineering um, on the internal combustion engine and this lecture is on the ideal engine cycles and the thermodynamics of the cycles. I say I'm Dr K and if you have any questions or comments regarding this lecture then please either contact me or come and see me um, in my room. The details are on the slide there. As I say, this is the second lecture in this series. The first was on engine geometry and components, and if you haven't already seen that one, I suggest you go back and watch that before um, listening to this lecture, and we'll be talking about combustion next. But this is on the thermodynamics of ideal engine cycles. The contents for this lecture are, first I'm just going to give a recap of week one, so some of the information that, I really, really, that you really should know. For this lecture that I've pulled out from the last lecture and then give a brief recap of thermodynamic principles before be talking about the ideal thermodynamic cycles for the auto cycle which is a spark ignition engine the diesel cycle which is compression ignition engine and a dual cycle um, which is a combination of the two and finally I'll finish off by talking about um, the differences between the ideal thermodynamic cycles and the real cycles that we get in practice. So I pulled this slide out from lecture one. So this slide introduced, on this slide I introduced the terminology associated with the engine. Um, again, I'm not going to go through it all now, but um, go, go back and look at the first lecture if you have, if you have difficulty remembering this. But what you should know is um, how to calculate the sweat volume, uh, what the clearance volume is, what the compression ratio is, that's important. We'll be talking about that a lot in this lecture. Um, and various other engine parameters. The second thing that I wanted to um, remind you of from the first lecture is the difference between compression ignition engines and spark ignition engines. So just to remind you, Compression ignition engine is when the fuel uh, in the diesel engine is c ignited when the temperature of the compressed air is above the auto ignition of the temperature of the fuel. And this gives fairly slow burning diffusion flame. Whereas for a spark ignition engine, typically fuel and air are mixed together, kind of giving you a premixed flame. And that's combustion is initiated by a spark, which gives you a faster premixed flame. So I'm just going to recap some of the thermodynamic processes that we'll be talking about um, when we when we go through the ideal cycles. So the first is isobaric. Now this is a process that's carried out at constant pressure, hence isobaric. Isochoric is a process that's carried out at constant volume. Isothermal is a process that's carried out at constant temperature. Now, if you remember from your first year thermo, an adi adiabatic process means that there's no heat transfer of heat between a system and its surroundings. So, in other words, it's perfectly lagged and insulated, so all temperature um, changes internal. And energy is only transferred as work. Isentropic means that there's constant ent entropy throughout the process. In other words, it's reversible, so you've got a reversible a diabatic process. And finally I just want to remind you of the first year law of thermodynamics which states that the change in internal energy of a system is equal to uh, Q which is the heat supplied less W which is the work done on the system. So heat supplied less work done is equal to the change in en internal energy of the system and this is for a, a closed, closed system. Now in thermodynamics, the PV diagram or pressure volume diagram is used to plot the changes of pressure with volume for a process. And what this allows you to do is to determine the work that's done um, within the within the system and any heat transferred and thereby analyze the, the process. So for a PV diagram, the area under the curve is the work done. So if you integrate the change of pressure with volume, that's where you get the work done. So we've got a um, an imaginary cycle here. So you're going from state 
Process A is taking you from state 1 to 2, which is constant pressure, isobaric. Process B is taking us from state 2 to 3, which is isochoric, um, constant volume. And process 3 is taking us 3 to 4, indeed, background to 1. So it's, we're finishing up where we're starting in the cycle. So processes 1 to, one to 2 to 3 are producing work, and processes 3 to 4 to 1 require work. Um, as I say, this is a pressure volume diagram. This could equally be plotted on a temperature on this axis, temperature on this axis, entropy plot, um, which I'll talk about in the next couple of slides. But as I say, the, the, the whole idea of these cycles is to um, plot them so we can calculate the work that's done and the heat supplied and derive efficiencies, so ideal efficiencies from that. These are idealised thermodynamic cycles, so we're um, neglecting friction, uh, heat transfer with the outside surroundings, it's perfectly light, um, etc. So making a lot of assumptions um, which aren't necessarily true in reality but does allow us to uh, calculate the, the um, parameters and efficiencies associated with the process. This is also called the um, the, the so-called air standard cycle. So what that really means in practice is what we're saying is in our system we have a gas which is behaving as an ideal gas there but therefore all the ideal gas equations applied to that uh, system so when we go from different states we can use those laws to calculate the the end the end conditions okay so I'm now going to talk through the PV diagram for an Otto cycle so we're going to start off at state naught so you'll notice that we've got a small volume and a small pressure so we're at the top of our in intake stroke effectively so if we think about the four um, cycle gasoline engine now this PV diagram won't entirely um, tie up with the four stroke um, cycle but um, so I have included it just to try and illustrate it but it doesn't follow exactly so anyway, so going from state 0 to state 1, we've got an isobaric process, it's inducting, so the intake valve is open, the piston's coming down, we're drawing in our fresh charge, and the volume is increasing, but the pressure isn't changing. As we go from state 1 to 2, we are in the compression stroke, um, so we're compressing the air in the cylinder, and so that's why we get... Uh, a rise in pressure with temperature. Now, no, what we're going to assume is that the cylinder is perfectly insulated and lagged, so there is no heat transfer during a compression stroke. Therefore, this process is isentropic, um, and then so we can describe that using the ideal gas laws. What we're going to say is during the combustion stroke. So when we get to um, position 2, we're at top dead centre. Now that is when the um, igniter sparks, so the auto cycle is for a spark ignition engine. So there's the ignition and the fuel combusts instantaneously. So you can see that there's a change in pressure but there is no associated change in volume. So you're saying at top dead centre, you've got the ignition, all the fuel is um, combusted instantaneously which gives you um, a big rise in pressure but no change in volume. So what you get here is you get effectively get a heat flow in. Now in reality the the heat is obviously being generated from the chemical reaction with the fuel in the air but in terms of the cycle we can treat that as heat being supplied to the system. And as I say because it's uh, instantaneous we can say it's isochoric, no change in pressure, only sorry, no change in volume, only a change in pressure. Now, as that um, hot gas um, creates a pressure which pushes down on the piston, we then get what we'd think of as our um, power stroke, combustion stroke. Again, during this, we're assuming that there is no heat transfer between the hot gases and the cylinder. Um, which 
strictly isn't true and we'll talk about that in the um the lecture that covers heat transfer but again for this idealized cycle we're assuming that there is no heat transfer so that takes us down to state four which is bottom dead center then the final process is we have an instantaneous exhaust of the gases so at the when we're at bottom dead center the valve exhaust valve opens and we're assuming that we instantaneously lose the heat or the exhaust gases um, leave the chamber so that's why we've got a queue out here again that's isochoric we're assuming that that happens instantaneously at bottom dead center so there's no change in volume only a change in pressure then um, the exhaust stroke uh, which is shown from going from one to zero so we're assuming that um, the piston comes up and just displaces the exhaust gases in in the cylinder again with no change in pressure just a change in volume again not strictly true but just to re-emphasize it it is an ideal cycle so this is the um, what's called the idealized um, air standard cycle for the, the auto for the auto cycle now I did say a few slides back that we could represent that um, not just as a pressure volume um, diagram which is fairly intuitive you can understand pressures and volumes you can visualize in your head and you can work it out but because um, it is an ideal gas you can also work out the associated temperature entropy diagram and this is quite important because it does if you if you think about it in this terms it does help you understand the process uh, a little more so this time we're not starting off at state zero um, we're going to start off at state one which is um, the, which is bottom dead center just before the compression stroke now if you remember from the previous slide we said that the compression compression stroke going from state one to two was isentropic which means that there's constant entropy so we can plot down here so if we go from one to two we have constant entropy so um, obviously no change in entropy so it's just a vertical line upwards so we still have a change in temperature just no change in entropy then at top dead center as the when the igniter ignites the fuel uh, we get heat flow in and if you remember this is isochoric so no change in volume so volume is a constant on this line we have heat supplied in but so we have a change in temperature and also a change in entropy to get to state three now during the power stroke um, which we also said was isentropic so reversible adiabatic process we have constant entropy so we, but we do have an associated change in temperature going from three to four and then to close the cycle we're going from four to one which is when our um, exhaust valves open and we expel the gases but in terms of our idealized cycle we don't expel gases because it's a clear system but we're saying there's an associated heat loss we get an isochoric heat loss um, which gives us a change in temperature and entropy till we get back to our initial state so it is very important that you understand how these cycles can be expressed in terms of pressure volume as well as ten um, temperature and entropy I'm now going to show you how to work out the thermal efficiency for the Id idealized Otto cycle so it's an ideal or your um, idealized efficiency before I talk through the equations and how how that's achieved just gonna point out that on the left here I'm gonna leave up the pressure volume um, plot for the Otto cycle you'll notice I've removed the um, induction and exhaust stroke from this diagram if you remember that both those processes were isobaric at the same pressure and assume that no work was done during that process so it doesn't add anything to the cycle basically you're just going from one to zero and back again with no no work done no heat supplied so it doesn't add anything to the cycle so i've removed it so what we're really doing in this cycle is we're saying that we've got a um 
some gas which is trapped in the cylinder which we know that it's not because we in take a new charge and we expel the exhaust gases but for this idealized cycle we're assuming that we've got a closed system with the gas in that is compressed one to two then we supply some heat not not that we inject fuel and we ignite it and that combustion gives us heat but that we instantaneously add heat to the system that then gives us a rising pressure that gives us a power stroke and then through this process we extract heat from the system not that in reality what happens that the, the exhaust gas is vented but the heat is instantaneously extracted from the system and I've shown also shown the temperature NHP diagram as well um, you can use either of these okay so thermal efficiency the thermal efficiency of a system is defined as the work that done, the useful that's work that is done, divided by the heat that you supplied. So in other words, how much work do I get per my unit of heat that I put into the system? That's that's really what you're trying to do. Obviously you want 100%, you're not going to get it, but um, this is the definition. Now for auto cycle, it can be shown that the thermal efficiency is equal to 1 minus the inverse of the R which if you remember that's the compression ratio uh, to the gamma minus one so we get this is what we're going to show it's quite a neat um, obviously expression uh, that you, you end up with um, and I'm going to lead you through it now so if you remember from the first law of thermodynamics we said that the change in internal energy is equal to um, heat supplied minus the work done so in terms of our cycle, the change in internal energy, going from 1 to 2 to 3 to 4 back to 1, um, is equal to the net heat supplied in that system minus the net work done in that system. So if we're going from, we're going to use this diagram, from 1 to 2 to 3 to 4 to back to 1, what's the internal, what's the change in internal energy? Well, because we've ended up exactly where we started, the change in internal energy has to be zero. So from that, we can say that if the change in internal energy is zero, then the change in the net change in um, heat flow has got to equal the net um, work done. And that makes sense because we've ended up here. We've put heat in, we've taken heat out, we've done some work, uh, sorry, some work has been done and we've done some work. So those two have to equate each other, otherwise we wouldn't get back to the same place. So therefore, we can say that the thermal efficiency is equal to the work done divided by the heat in. But because we can say that the network is equal to the, um, the sorry, the network is equal to the net heat supplied, we can rewrite that as the Q net over the heat supplied, which is equal to Q two to three, so the heat that's supplied here minus the heat that's extracted here divided by the heat that's added, which is heat Q two to three. So I've copied up the equation for the thermal efficiency that we derived on the last slide up here. So changing so the thermal efficiency is um, the net heat supplied divided by the heat in. Now this is expressed in terms of heat flow, and that isn't particularly useful because um, the heat flow is very hard to measure. We can calculate it from heat input, etc. But it's quite difficult to measure. But what we can measure more readily is temperature. So now I'm going to show you how to express this equation in terms of temperature, um, which is something that we say so we can more easily measure. So if we remember from first year thermo that the heat required to heat a gas from some temperature, let's say X, to another hotter temperature, let's say Y, at constant volume is this equation. Um, before we come to this, I'm just going to say, mind you, that the first part of this um, equation here, that is the first law of thermodynamics. So the change in internal energy, so from um, the change in internal energy is equal to the heat supplied minus the work done but because we're at constant volume remember 
um, there is no work done so that tends to zero so we're just left with that expression there now the change in internal energy can be expressed as the mass times the specific heat constant volume uh, times by the difference in temperature so this is what we're going to use to substitute into this equation if you can't remember um, how to do this please look at your first year thermo notes so as I say substituting this into the top equation so that gives us um, uh, MCV uh, T3 minus T2 minus MCV T at the temperature at 4 minus temperature at 1 all over MCV T3 minus T2 so you can s what I'm going to show is you can reduce this down so you should hopefully see that all these masses and uh, specific um, heats will cancel out so we end up with T3 minus T2 minus T4 minus T1 over T3 minus T2 and you could should also be able to rewrite that as or um, this here so you have thermal efficiency is equal to 1 minus T4 minus T1 over T3 minus T2 if, if you can't see how I've done this um, please have a go with yourself with a bit of scrap paper and pencil on um, but it should be fairly intuitive so we've now ended up with the thermal efficiency expressed in terms of temperature which we can measure but um, remember this isn't what I wanted I wanted to show it in terms of uh, the, the compression ratio which is an even neater but I wanted to show you this step because um, A it's how you get there but B this could also be used um, in practice so what I'm hopefully going to show you is a bulletproof way of um, once you've got of reducing the thermal efficiency for all of the cycles from so if you can get to a, a point where you have the thermal efficiency of the system written in terms of only temperatures uh, then I'm going to show you how you can that can be um, reduced down to parameters which are pertinent to the engine so the first thing to do is to write down all the processes in terms of temperature ratios we're going to go around the system from 1 to 2 2 to 3 3 to 4 4 to 1 writing it all down in terms of temperature ratio so let's start off from 1 to 2 so if remember 1 to 2 is an isentropic process constant entropy so we can say that the temperature at 1 times the volume at 1 uh, all raised to the um, gamma minus 1 is equal to T2 V2 raised to the gamma one, minus 1 I'm not going to um, show you how to get this this is an ideal gas law uh, you derived in your first year thermo if you can't remember how you get to this um, please please go and have a look at it again so what that yields if we rearrange that equation we can write T2 over T1 in terms of the volume ratio V1 over V2 all to the gamma minus 1 and what we should hopefully recognize is that uh, V1 over V2 so um, this is V1 here and this is V2 up here that is our compression ratio so it's the total volume divided by um, the, the clearance volume so T2 over T1 is equal to R to the gamma minus 1 where R is the compression ratio now going from 2 to 3 this is an isochoric process so from the ideal gas law we have P2 um, V2 over T2 is equal to P3 um, P3 V3 over T3 and because we're constant volume these cancel um, they're the same so we can take those out of the equation and that means that we can rewrite um, our temperature ratio so remember this is what we're doing we're going around the thing we're writing everything in terms of temperature ratios you, you'll see why this is important on the next slide so we're going from T3 so, so T3 over T2 is equal to P3 over P2 and what we can rewrite this as is this is a new parameter so what I'm going to do is I'm going to call this as this pressure ratio so it's pressure ratio so it's pressure at 3 divided by the pressure at 2 which is equal to the temperature ratio if we go from 3 to 4 we have another 
isentropic process up here. So again, using um, one of the gas laws, we can write T3, um, sorry, T4 over T3 in terms of V3 over V4. Now, what's important to recognize here is that the volume at 4 is equal to the volume at 1, and the volume at 3 is equal to the volume at 2. So we can rewrite V3 over V4 as V2 over V1 because the volumes are these volumes are the same and these volumes are the same. So the, what we have now is instead of the compression ratio which we had up here we've got the inverse of the compression ratio. So we can write um, the temperature ratio is 1 over uh, R to the gamma minus 1. Notice this isn't the gamma minus 1 because this is unity, so whatever you, the exponent of this will always be unity, so it means that we can write it um, that way. So we've got all of our processes expressed in terms of temperature ratios, so the next th thing to do is to express the thermal efficiency in terms of um, temperature ratio, and then we can simply substitute the temp temperature ratios in and reduce that equation. So what we're going to do is say write the thermal efficiency in terms of ratio, temperature ratios. So what I've done here is just divided through by, um, on the top, I divided by through by T1. So what you're basically doing is trying to um, reduce the last thing in the bracket to 1. So divide through by T1. So to do that, I have to have T4 over T1. So T1 times all this will give me exactly the same thing here. And likewise on the bottom, I've divided through by T2, so that gives me T2 times T3 over T2 minus 1. Now, I have a um, temperature ratio for T3 over T2 from the previous slide, but I don't have a temperature ratio for T4 over T1. Um, and I do have a temperature ratio for T1 over T2. So what I'm going to show you now is a bit of a mathematical trick, and it might seem like a fudge. Um, doing it this way and I've kind of had a look there are kind of simpler ways of maybe doing this just for the auto cycle but the way that I'm going to show you how to do it is um, what I think it's a universal way of doing it so whether you're trying to reduce down the auto cycle the diesel cycle or even the dual cycle if you follow this method you'll you'll get the right answer um, so there's no shortcuts this way but it is a universal way so you only need to remember to do it this way so that said, if you recognise that T4 over T1 can be rewritten like this, so we're saying that T4 over T can be written as T4 over T3, T3 over T2, T2 over T1. Now, of course, all these would cancel, so those would cancel, those would cancel, those would cancel, those would cancel, and you've got the same thing. Um, so we're writing this way. This has got nothing to do with the um, the thermodynamic cycle but in right, this is just another mathematical way of writing it so now we have everything in terms of temperature ratio so we've got a temperature ratio for t1 to t2 we've got one from 3 to 4 3 to 2 and 2 to 1 so the next step is now to substitute in the temperature ratios that we have from the previous slide so if we remember that um, t to t1 was our compression ratio as a function of gamma t3 to t2 was our pressure ratio and T4 to 3 was the inverse of the um, compression ratio as a function of gamma. So substituting those all in, so we have 1 minus T1 over T2, so T1 over T2 but it's T2 over T1 so we have the inverse of gamma to minus 1, times by um, T4 over T3, that's this term here. Uh, T3 over T2 is that term, and T2 over T1 is that term. So what you can hopefully see is in here, in this expression, um, these will cancel, giving us unity. And so what we end up with is we end up with uh, the pressure ratio minus 1 divided by the pressure ratio minus 1. So these will cancel, giving us unity. So all in all, what we end up with is 
the thermal efficiency is equal to 1 minus uh, the inverse of the compression ratio to gamma minus 1. Okay, so that's how you do it. So just to recap, there's the, the, the way that I'm proposing that you do this is 1. Write, go around the system and write each process in terms of a temperature ratio. Secondly, express the thermal efficiency of your system in terms of temperature ratio. And then lastly, you have all the temperature ratios. You have your thermal efficiency expressed in terms of temperature ratio. So substitute in the temperature ratios and you should be able to reduce that um, equation down to the final solution. So what I've got here is um, I've shown the um, efficiency of the ideal um, auto cycle um, versus the compression ratio. So you can see that um, as obviously as your compression ratio increases, your so does your thermal efficiency. But you can see it's going up and up and up, and it, you do start kind of getting to a law of um, dim diminishing returns, but it's still going up. So the question is, is a gasoline engines typically have rate compression ratios between 8 and 12, so this sort of range. So why aren't we running our gasoline engines with compression ratios of 20 or more? We could get an idea, theoretically, we could get a higher thermal efficiency. Well, the reason for that is because of the fuel itself. What's limiting the compression ratio of spark ignitions is um, knocking, pinging, detonation. These are all terms for um, the explosion of the gasoline fuel outside the normal flame front. So what we're saying is if we do go to these higher compression ratios, what we've come down to now is the fundamental difference between a compression ignition engine and spark ignition engine. If we try to run a um, gasoline engine at these sorts of compression ratios, then the fuel would auto-ignite before it was initiated by the spark. So we wouldn't be able to control that combustion and the engine wouldn't behave in the same way. So the answer to this is what is causing, um, uh, so what is limiting the compression ratio of uh, g gasoline engines, it's the fuel. And there's a number that characterise this. You've probably s seen this on the forecourt, Ron. Um, now this stands for the research octane number. And what this is, is this is a measure of the fuel's knocking characteristics. So for a particular engine, um, you want your fuel to have uh, a RON research octane number within certain limits to prevent auto ignition or you know knocking and pinging occurring in your engine. So this is <coughs> carried out um, in a in a lab. The the research octane number is determined in a lab, and what it really um, stands for, or what it, what the research octane number actually is is it's the equivalent ratio of iso-octane to heptane. So as far as the test is concerned, iso-octane has a RON of 100, heptane has RON of 0. So if you have a fuel which has an octane number of 90, then what you're really saying is that this has the same knock characteristics as a mixture of 90% iso-octane and 10% heptane. That's what you're saying. And I've just put in a table to show um, the rated octane number of some common pump fuels. Um, you probably know already that in the UK and Europe um, the, the minimum rated octane number requirement for our fuel is about 95. Um, and But you can get premium fuels which have a higher and just of interest, I just thought I'd show you um, this for ethanol, so it's much higher by putting biofuel into our fuels, we're, we're improving its, its not characteristics. So I showed the, you how to derive the thermal efficiency for a spark ignition auto cycle. We're now going to do the same for um, a diesel cycle. So in the same way that we built up the pressure volume diagram for the auto cycle now I'm just going to do it for the diesel cycle. So we're going to start in exactly the same place, initial um, state of zero, so we're 
top dead center, it's got a small volume, um, also small pressure. So with the top of the um, intake stroke. So during the intake stroke, um, the volume increases. We take in our fresh charge. Then we compress it. And again, at, likewise with the auto cycle, this is an isentropic process. So they were saying that during this compression stroke, there is no um, heat transfer between the gas and the cylinder walls. So this is a reversible process. So we've got change in pressure and volume. Now, if you notice, I've kind of tried to um, do this a little bit to scare, although they're imaginary pressures. So because um, we've got a higher pressure here, higher compression ratios with diesel engine, then what happens is, unlike a spark ignition engine where the fuel is ignited at top dead center, at top dead center in a diesel engine, what we're effectively doing is spraying in the fuel into the engine. So the combustion process is different. Um, because we're spraying the fuel in at top dead center, what we're really saying is that um, as we spray the fuel in, it starts to burn. And as it starts to burn, it's pushing down the cylinder. So we have a change in volume. This is um, an isobaric process, not an isochoric process as it was for the auto engine. So we have an isobaric process. So we, we put fuel um, in, we have an associated heat release, and so we've got energy in. And because diesel is slow burning compared to gasoline, this is considered a constant pressure process rather than a constant volume process. Um, so that takes us from two to three. Then the the rest of what we would consider the um, power stroke is isentropic. So going from three to four, um, this is an isentropic process. Um, so I should just point out here, going the ratio of volumes from two to three. This is called the um, the cutoff ratio. So in an, in a um, a gasoline, uh, sorry, a diesel engine. The ratio of the volume to when the the fuel is stopped being injected to um, top dead center is called the cutoff ratio. Um, and then the last process then is exactly the same as for spark ignition engine. That when the um, piston reaches the end of its stroke, is at bottom dead center, the exhaust valves open and we get an instantaneous isochoric uh, process whereby the heat is removed and if we want to show it um, this is the um, exhaust stroke before we induct and over again. So this is the basic PV diagram for a diesel engine. The main difference being that this is an isobaric process rather than an isochoric process but due to, which is due to the fundamental way in which the fuels burn. So, I'm going to show you the temperature entropy diagram for a diesel cycle, as well as a PV diagram. Starting at 1, so forget about the, in date, it, the induction and the exhaust stroke. Um, just concentrating on the, the processes in which work or energy is supplied. So, you start off at 1. So, if you remember, when we compressed the gas, we said that was an isentropic process. So, um... No change in entropy, only a change in temperature. So this is during a compression stroke. And this, to remind you, this is reversible. We could go from 2 to 1 as easy as we could go from 1 to 2. At top dead center, um, this is when the fuel is injected and we get combustion. So that is our isobaric process. Pressure is constant along here, although temperature and entropy change as the heat is supplied. Then during our power stroke um, as the piston comes down that's isentropic so we have a change in temperature but no change in entropy and then finally as the exhaust gas is open um, the exhaust port is opened or in our model we extract heat and that is an isochoric process uh, meaning constant volume <laughs> and notice that what, what I've kind of tried to do deliberately on here is that these lines are kind of different gradients 
suggesting or hoping to indicate that this is isobaric and this is isochoric. I'm now going to show you how to show that the thermal efficiency, the ideal thermal efficiency for the diesel cycle um, is equal to this relationship. You'll notice that this is different to the relationship to the Otto cycle um, which expresses the thermal efficiency only in terms of the compression ratio whereas we have some additional terms in this equation we have RC which is a cutoff ratio which to remind you is the cutoff ratio is the ratio of volumes at which the fuel is cut off so that's V3 divided by V2 so I'm going to show you how to, to derive this we start off in exactly the same way as we did for the Otto cycle so the thermal efficiency is equal to the work done divided by the heat in um, which is equal to the heat supplied from 2 to 3 minus um, the heat rejected at 4 to 1 over the heat supplied from 2 to 3 <coughs> go back a couple of slides if you if you need reminding on how to do that to get to this equation here and I also showed you that the heat supplied is related to the temperature so I can rewrite this in terms of temperature where the thermal efficiency is equal to MCP 3 to 2 now this is important this is now um, CP between 2 and 3 because it's a constant pressure process instead of a constant volume process and the whereas um, we use CV for <coughs> the temperatures between 4 and 1 because that is a constant volume process not a constant pressure process so the thermal efficiency can be expressed in t terms of this all the M's cancel out uh, and we're left with this so the thermal efficiency is equal to 1 minus T4 over T1 divided by gamma T3 over T2 and gamma comes from the fact that we have CV divided by um, sorry CV divided by CP which is gamma so again if you're not not quite sure how I got this from that please just use prove it to yourself we've now got our thermal efficiency in terms of temperature and gamma in this instance so exactly as I showed you for the Otto cycle this is a three-step process and if you follow this pro process then you should end up with a thermal efficiency in terms of engine parameters um, so you can calculate it easily so first <coughs> write all the processes in terms of temperature ratio then secondly write the thermal efficiency in terms of temperature ratio and three substitute the temperature ratios so we're going to start off with writing everything in terms of temperature ratios we're going to go 1 to 2, 2 to 3, 3 to 4 so from 1 to 2 this is an isentropic process so we can write the um, T1 V1 gamma to the minus 1 is equal to T2 V2 gamma to the minus 1 if we rearrange this in terms of the temperature ratio T2 over T1 we can write we can get V1 over V2 as a function of gamma and we recognize that um, V1 divided by V2 is the um, compression ratio. So we can write the temperature ratio between 2 and 1 as a function of the compression ratio. Now, going from 2 to 3. Now this is a slightly different to the last one, which was an ISO um, correct process. This is an ISO Barrett process. So if we write... Um, P2 V2 over T2 <coughs> is equal to P3 V3 over T3. Now, instead of cancelling the volumes this time, because um, uh, those are changing, it's pressure that stays constant. So now the pressures can change. So we can rewrite this now as T3 over T2 is equal to V3 over V2. And if we now know that V3 over V2 is the cutoff ratio so we can write T3 over V T3 over T2 is equal to the cutoff ratio now from 3 to 4 this is an isentropic process again so as for 1 to 2 we can write that in terms of um, temperature volume and gamma 
And if we rewrite that, we get, let's rearrange that, we get the temperature ratio is equal to V3 over V4 gamma to the minus 1. Now, what I'm going to do here, again, is a little mathematical trick. Um, just to rewrite the volumes um, in terms of volume ratio. So instead of going, say, in the ra volume ratio from 3 to 4, we can say that the volume rate, that's exactly equal to the the volume ratio of 3 to 2 and 2 to 4. And so we can see that the now the V2s would cancel, giving us exactly the same thing, but we're just writing it like this, which is mathematically co correct. And what you can hopefully um, recognize is that we know what V3 to 2 is. That's the um, cutoff ratio, so we can put that in there. Now, what's V2 to 4? Well, if we um, look up here, the volume at 4 is the same as the volume at 1. So we could actually write this as V2 over V1 instead of V2 over 3 V4. And what's V2 to V1? <coughs> well, that's the um, the inverse of the compression ratio. Um, so we can write the temperature ratio from 4 to 3 as the cutoff ratio divided by the compression ratio to gamma minus 1. So we've got all the temperature ratios. We need to express our thermal efficiency in terms of temperature ratio. And again, the way to do that is try and reduce the last term in each bracket to 1. So on the top, we're going to divide through by T1. So we've got T4 of T1 minus 1, all times T1. And on the bottom, we've got T2. So we're going to divide through by T2. We've got T3 of T2. Now we've got temperature ratios for T1 to T2 and T3, T3 to T2, but we haven't got one for T4 to 1. So remember that we can write that as T4 over T3, T3 over T2, T2 over T1. Now we have um, temperature ratios for all of these, so we can now substitute in the temperature ratios. So if we put all those in, these are the, the values from the previous slide, we end up with um, this expression here, and now we can do some cancelling out in here to end up with the the right answer. So we have r to the gamma minus 1 on the bottom times by r to the gamma minus 1. So those can go. And so what we're left with is rc to the gamma minus 1 times by rc. And if you remember your rules of exponents, that will give you r to the gamma because this is effectively rc to the gamma minus 1 times rc to the 1. So you've got gamma minus 1 plus 1. So that just gives you gamma. If you don't understand how to do that, have a, have a go yourself. Look at the rules for the exponents. And then the bottom remains unchanged. So we can see that our thermal efficiency boils down to this relationship between the cutoff uh, ratios, gamma, and the compression ratio. So I showed you how to do the calculate the thermal efficiency for a diesel cycle and an auto cycle. Now there is this thing called the dual cycle, which is basically a combination of the two. So rather than just purely having an isochoric pressurized for an auto cycle or an isobaric um, combustion process for the diesel engine, kind of have a um, split between the two. And reality, this is... Um, the kind of constant volume heat addition and constant pressure heat addition is m more realistic of what's going on in a um, in a combustion engine, um, and it can be shown that the thermal efficiency of this is this rather more complicated expression here, where the thermal efficiency is equal to one minus. Um, ratio function of the cutoff ratio which is v4 over v3 the pressure ratio which is um, p3 over p2 and the um, compression ratio which is v1 divided by v2 now i'm not going to derive this for you here because it's 
going to be one of the tutorial questions. So if you are unsure, not able to derive this um, using exactly the same processes that I showed before, please look at the tutorial solution. The solution on be on there. Any questions, come back to me. So I just wanted to show this as well. The 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 um you can also this is basically the TS diagram for the cycle in case what you you wondering what it looked like. I would expect you the um to be able to look at um derive these efficiencies from TS diagrams or PV di diagrams. Um so process one to two that was isentropic so we have no change of entropy but we have a change in temperature. Then we have our constant volume heat addition followed by our constant pressure heat addition. So it's kind of this double um, cycle here where we have a change in temperature and entropy till our the, the power stroke effectively is isentropic and then we have our constant volume heat um, rejection. Okay, so what we have here is on the left we have the um, PV diagram for a for the ideal Otto cycle, and on the right we have a, um, an illustration of a real cycle, and we'll just start looking at the differences between the two and <clears throat> seeing why some of the assumptions that we made at the start aren't perhaps valid. So. If you remember, we said that when we go from during a compression stroke, um, there's no that is isentropic. And to be honest, this is the only part of the the real cycle which does closely resemble um, what we assumed in the ideal cycle. And often this um, assumption of uh, isentropic compression isn't a bad one. But it's not exact. We have um, because there are crev crevices and in the engine, so by the valves and um, where, where the gas can get and its heat is lost, and also um, there are leaks in the engine past past the piston. We can lose um, pressure and temperature, so it's not an ex ideal. Uh, isentropic compress compression, but re in reality, it's not that bad. However, where we do see big differences is we assumed that the um, combustion process was isochoric, so no change in volume, and also that there was no heat transfer. But in reality, that's obviously not the case. Um, the gases, the combustion gases, are thousands of degrees at this point. The surrounding metal is um, hundred, you know, tens to hundreds of degrees, with the cooling taking it away. So there is going to be a heat transfer process there. It has to be, otherwise it, the engine would melt. So that results in a lower pressure. I've tried to draw this a little bit to scale, to try and give you an idea. So we don't end up with the same peak pressure because we do have heat transfer, which uh, results in a, a lower pressure. Also, because um, in our real engine we can't have we have finite combustion time, so here we assumed that the combustion process um, was instantaneous, i.e., it took place over an infinitely small time. But that's obviously not true. The fuel does take time to burn. So what that means is that the um, combustion process continues um, after top dead centre. So as the piston is starting to come down on the power stroke, the fuel is still burning. burning. So our peak power doesn't occur at top dead centre. It actually occurs slightly after because there is this finite time for the fuel to combust. We also have uh, heat transfer during the... Um, power stroke um, obviously we've still got those hot gases uh, transferring heat to the walls so we end up with a losing with a lower pressure so this means that, that this um, is no longer isentropic and reversible we also have incomplete combustion 
but and that gives about five percent loss in available chemical energy so again that's reducing our peak peak power then as we come to the bottom rather than having this instantaneous heat rejection where the valves are instantly open all heat is extracted again that obviously can't occur so typically the um, exhaust valves are open before bottom dead center so that they get the pressure in the cylinder um, falls below the isentropic line um, again th this is just the nature of a real world engine that we have to um, we can't do everything instantaneously because it takes time for valves to open etc and lastly we assume that no work was done during the expansion and induction stroke that we could just reject air take in air with no work being done again in an engine we have friction losses um, so we have pumping losses where we need to um, pump the the air out and draw in the fresh charge so we end up with a pumping loss um, at, the, at the, the end of the stroke so this, this just highlights the differences between what we assumed in our model and what we get in reality that concludes this second lecture on ideal engine cycles um, I hope you enjoyed it if there's any questions comments you have please contact me uh, my details are there and thank you for listening